Okay, this is chapter one and two of The Golden Goblet by Eloise Jarvis McGraw. Uh, we're going to be reading these two chapters, but first we're going to be defining some of the terms in it. Um, so we have crucible is a vessel of very refractory material used for melting and calcining a substance that requires a high degree of heat. Um, it could also mean a severe test. Hireling is a person employed to undertake menial work. Servility is an excessive willingness to serve or please others. Sedge is a grass-like plant with triangular stems and inconspicuous flowers growing typically in wet ground. Sedges are widely distributed throughout temperate and cold regions. Temerity is excessive confidence or boldness, audacity. Ingot is a block of steel, um, gold, silver, or other metal, typically oblong in shape. Ingot, sorry, mispronounced that. Um, annealing is um, heating, and this is typically metal or glass, and then allowing it to cool slowly in order to remove internal stresses and to make it easier to work. Seidel is to walk in a furtive, unobtrusive, or timid manner, especially sideways or obliquely. Papyrus is a material prepared in Egypt, ancient Egypt, from the pithy stem of a water plant used in sheets throughout the ancient Mediterranean world for writing or painting on and also for making ropes, sandals, and boats. Waif is a homeless, child, homeless, neglected, or abandoned person, especially a child. Amulet is an ornament or small piece of jewelry thought to give protection against evil, danger, or disease. Sibilant is making or characterized by a hissing sound. Shenti is a simple kilt worn by men. Obsidian is a hard glass-like volcanic rock formed by the rapid solidification of lava without crystallization. Okay, here we go. Chapter one. The stream of molten gold flowed smoothly from the crucible, reflecting in its surface the cloudless blue of the Egyptian sky. The boy Ranofer slowly tightened his grip on the two stones between which he held the crucible as he tilted it farther and farther. Devotion in every careful movement of his hands and bare brown shoulders. Presently, the last drop of flame-colored liquid had run without splash or bubble into the hollowed stone. With a sigh of satisfaction, the boy set stones and crucible aside and wiped the sweat from his hands upon his cotton kilt. It was a good ingot. The goldsmith would be able to find no fault with it. Already the metal was setting, the brilliant red-yellow fading to scarlet, then to cherry. In half a minute, it could be turned out and the mold oiled for the next pouring. Dreamily, Ranafir watched the colors dull. Splendid images drifted through his mind, golden forms and shapes, any one of which might be the destiny of this very small ingot that he, Ranafir, the son of Thutra, had poured. It might become part of a wide and glittering collar or the inlay on a fine dagger for some nobleman's tomb. Or, better, a cup fit for Pharaoh himself, shaped like a flower and hammered to fragile thinness. Well, perhaps not the cup, Ranifer admitted to himself after a little reflection. It was only a small ingot after all. Besides, such a cup as he had pictured could never come from this particular gold house. No one here had the skill to fashion it, not even Wreck, the goldsmith himself. Only Zhao, the greatest gold worker in all Thebes, could make such a cup. Zhao, the master, could make anything. From his artist's fingers sprang objects of such wonderful beauty. Cups, bowls, boxes, necklaces, 
daggers, great golden collars, bracelets, exquisite amulets, that Pharaoh himself would be served by no other smith. To think I might have been his pupil some day, if my father had lived, Ranifer thought. He all but said he would accept me. I, if my father had not died, if I had never had to go and live with Gebu, if I had never, ever even heard of Gebu, the unwelcome picture of Gebu's face broke through Renifer's preoccupation, scattering his daydreams and rousing him to present reality in which Zhao the master had no place. He was aware again of voices, of the clang of tools around him in the mud-walled courtyard, and the sharp, hot odor of metal mingling with the soft afternoon breeze of the Nile. It was the mouth of Hathor in the season of growing, and sorry, the month of Hathor in the season of growing, and the air was cool despite the heat from the hooded furnaces that lined the courtyard. Even Lord Ra, the sun did not scorch and burn in this pleasant winter time, but shed his radiant light beneficently upon the brown backs of the men bent to their work, striking blue gleams from their ink-black hair and snowy kilts, glancing with blinding intensity off gold ingots and gold wire coils and the scraps of bits of gold that littered their low work tables. Instead of an answering sense of peace, Renifer felt only the sore and familiar longing for other days, when he could have rejoiced in a gentle sun and work he loved, when both his father, Thutra, and Zhao the master were a part of his life, a large part, and his half-brother, Gebu, the stonecutter, no part at all. Do not ruin the day by thinking of Gebu, the boy told himself. Do you not see enough of him and his heavy hand at home? That ingot has set, and here you stand idle. He turned the ingot out and tried to lose himself again to his task, lose himself again to his tasks. But the thought of Gebu, like the ache of a tooth, was hard to lose. Besides, his tasks were those of a hireling. No matter how expertly he did them, he could not hope to progress to anything better, as even the most stupid apprentice did. No matter what illustrious futures he imagined for the ingots he poured, his own future remained the same, pouring more ingots. Making charcoal, sweeping off the jeweler's benches, while others engraved the daggers and hammered the cups. All because of Gebu. Why can I not be apprenticed? Renifer asked himself for the hundredth time. Because Gebu does not wish it. But why does he not wish it? The pig, the son of Set, the devil. Why must he place me here in the gold house if I am never to learn anything? No matter. It was useless to try to fathom the ways of the accursed one. His reasons were his own. And to protect... Protest bought, brought only beatings, as Ranifer had found out long ago. Here he was, and here he would stay until Gebu ordered otherwise. Ranifer picked up the ingot, which was now cool enough to handle, and carried it to the nearby workbench on which the draw plate stood. It was a circular slab of stone, held upright in a vise, in a vise and pierced with a ring of holes of diminishing sizes. One of the apprentices stood there drawing wire, his shoulder muscles bunched with the effort of pulling a greased, reed-slim ingot through a hole just too small for it. It would be slimmer yet when he had passed through the hole. When it had passed through the hole, then it would be passed through the one just smaller and so through every hole in turn, growing longer and slimmer all the time until it changed from an ingot into wire. On the bench beside the apprentice lay a cool coil of wire, finished and ready for its last annealing. Beside the coil lay a row of three thin ingots waiting to be drawn. Renifer added his own, the thinnest of all. Perhaps by evening it would be wire, rounded and tempered, ready to fashion into a linked collar for some lovely lady's neck. Somewhat comforted by the thought, he returned to oil his empty mold. Too late, he saw a familiar hunched figure emerging from the rear door of the shop, directly next the pouring table. It was Ibni, the Babylonian porter, already bobbing and grinning at the sight of Ranifer, wishing Wreck the goldsmith would suddenly send him on an errand to the other side of Thebes, 
Ranafir turned his back on the man and reached for the oil jar. Ibni only edged closer, ducked his head even further between his shoulders, and scrubbed his hands together ingratiatingly. Ah, greeting, and how is little Ranafir today? he asked. His voice was like the sound of a badly made flute and sibilant with his Babylonian accent. I am well enough, Ranafir mumbled. Indeed, this worthless one rejoices that it is so. And what of my revered friend, your half-brother and protector, Gebu the stonecutter? Is he also well? Aye, Ranafir smeared oil into the mold, keeping his frowning gaze directly on his work. He could not have said why his dislike of Ibni was so intense. The man's servility disgusted him, and so did his cheese-white hands with their dirty nails and the stained teeth he revealed in his constant grin. But it was more than that. There was something slimily questionable about the Babylonian that always sent prickles up Ranafir's spine. Why Gebu com per permitted his occasional visits to their house was a mystery Ranafir could never cared to probe into. Gebu and Ibni were certainly not friends. They were more like master and dog. And the honored Gebu, did he enjoy my little gift of date wine last week? Did he find it as tasty as ever, young Ranafir? He did not say otherwise. What did he say, little one? Did he speak not at all when you handed him the wine, the wine skin to him? For indeed you did hand it to him, did you not? In his own hand, as you have done before? I, in his own hand, exactly as I've as I have always done. Ranafir threw an impatient glance at Ibni and encountered the sharp glint he had often surprised in the other's usually vacant eyes. It vanished instantly, and the Babylonian's smile spread wider than ever. Ranafir's distrust deepened accordingly. What does he want? The sneaking serpent, thought the boy. Aloud, he said, How can I remember what he said now, nine days later? Ah, well, it is of no matter. Doubtless my poor gift is not worthy of comment, though he honored me by enjoying it. It is a humble wine, but of a good flavor. My wife makes it herself from our own dates. I know, snapped Ranafir, exasperated at hearing it for the 50th time. He knew also that Gebu never drank the wine, although he always seemed eager to get it. Invariably, he waited until Ranafir was asleep, then in the night secretly poured it out on the pavement of the courtyard. Many times the boy had seen the brown stains next morning, still damp and faintly reeking of fermentation. There was something about the whole thing that was not what it seemed, something from which Renefier uneasily turned his mind whenever he thought of it. It was not healthy. He had long since learned to pry into Gebu's affairs. Meanwhile, Ibni was finally coming to what Renefier recognized at once as the point of the conversation. I, a very good wine, though humble. Now, if you would grant me the smallest of favor, young Ranafir, pray tell your brother that I shall send him another little wineskin on the morrow, which I beg he will accept with my highest regard. Tarry a bit outside the shop tomorrow at sunset, and I shall put it in your hand. Ibni took himself off at last. Stoppering the oil jug with nervous fingers, Ranafir watched him sidle past the wiremaker's bench to the big water jug, get himself a drink too brief to indicate real thirst, then go back through the rear door to his job of washing the raw gold. Ranafir was reminded of an adder slither, slithering back into its hole. He did not want the water, thought the boy. He had no errand in the courtyard at all, but merely invented one that he might find out whether I put his precious wineskin into Gebu's hand and tell me to wait for another tomorrow. But why? Why is... What is so important about the little skin of wine? Why can he not simply hand it to me sometime during the day instead of making a great secret of it outside the shop? Ranafir, the boy jumped guiltily. It was Sata, the first craftsman, calling to him from inside the shop. Hastily, he spread a scrap of clean linen over the mold and hurried across the courtyard. The light dimmed and cooled as he moved under the overhanging thatch of palm fronds and into the long three-sided shed. In a corner glowed two of the box-like furnaces. On a low stool before one of them sat Rek, the goldsmith, using a pointed blowpipe to direct the heat onto a golden ornament he held carefully in copper tongs. 
Three apprentices leaned over him watching, unmindful of the chatter of the porters washing raw gold in the big vats at the back of the room, of the weigher calling out numbers to the scribe standing beside the balance scales, of the loud ping, ping of the second craftsman's hammer upon a half-finished bowl. Ranafir lingered a moment. He too would have liked to watch Rec work, to note his way with a blowpipe, and how the flame must heat the bosses of the ornament, thereby adding a precious detail or two to his scant knowledge of the craft he had loved since babyhood. But Sata called again, Ranafir, come here, boy. By Ammon, I'll wager the snails would pass you by. Here, brush my table and mind you lose not a grain of gold. I want the sweepings refined and poured again before the sun sets. I neb, Sata. As the first craftsman moved away, scowling as usual, to set a finished collar upon the shelf. Renifer hurried to lo the low work table. A woven grass mat was spread on the ground before it. No one but Rec used a, t a stool, dropping to one knee and sinking back on his heel in the habitual pose of the gold worker. The boy took up the hare's foot and began to sweep gold dust, scraps, clippings, and bits of wire from the tabletop into the sheepskin that hung beneath its scooped-out front edge. There was more gold to be recovered from these leavings than one would suspect. He had poured that slim little ingot, now lying yonder in the courtyard beside the draw plate, from just such sweepings as this. Presently he would be pouring another. I have finished, Nebsata, murmured the boy. He scrambled to his feet and, unhooking the sheep hide from the table, emptied its contents into an earthen bowl. He had returned the hide to its place and was starting for the courtyard with the small with the bowl when the deep, gentle voice of Rec, the goldsmith, stopped him. Wait, Renafir, you have forgotten to weigh your gold. Weigh it? I have nothing but the sweep here, Neb, goldsmith. Nonetheless, it must be weighed. Did you not hear my orders this morning when... Nay, I remember I had sent you into the street of the potters to fit, fetch those crucibles. Rex sighed, arose from his stool and limped across to Ranafir, still holding the golden ornament in his tongs. His heavy face was worn, but kindly as he looked down at the boy. Know then, he said, that our weights do not tally properly at the end of each week, nor have they, ha have they for some months. Gold has been missing in such small quantities that for long we blamed the scales, but it is not the scales. Deeply shocked, Ranafir stood with the bowl forgotten in his hands. Gold missing, he repeated. A thief in the night, Neb Goldsmith? Nay, the guard's eyelids never close, and the storeroom seals are unbroken. It is someone in this shop who is robbing me. In the shop? But how? How could he... There are many ways to conceal a lump or two of gold, innocent one, put in the second craftsman gloomily. I agreed one of the apprentices. I have heard of men hiding small ingots in their mouths, or under their sandal straps, said another, or in a loaf of bread. There are many methods, as there are thieves, Rex said wearily, and we must discover the one which is plaguing us. The first step is to keep daily account of every grain, even the sweep. We shall catch him before long. Renifer was standing like an image, a sharp suspicion in his mind. Who in this shop would steal gold? Who was treacherous enough, low enough, save Ibni the, the Babylonian? It was only too easy to picture his white, moist hand with its filthy fingernails reaching out stealthily, but there was no way to prove such a suspicion. The goldsmith's hand grasped Renifer's shoulder and shook it gently. What ails you, boy? Are you asleep or struck dumb? I, I, neither Neb Goldsmith, Ranavir hesitated, his troubled eyes on the man before him. Wreck was an unimpressive figure, similar in build and feature to a hundred other men. With a suggestion of paunch and a foot maimed long ago by spilled molten metal. The falcon ornament held in his tongs was no better than half the goldsmiths in Thebes could fashion. He was no genius like Zhao, no artist like Thutra, the father of Ranafir. He was only an honest and kindly artisan, just now saddened by treachery. Nothing ails me, honored master, murmured the boy. I only wonder what evil one could find it in his heart to rob so good a man. Rex's homely face relaxed with pleasure. He was not accustomed to being called honored master by even his lowliest hireling. 
Do not trouble your head about it, Renafir, but make certain to weigh your sweep, that we may make this robber's task too difficult to continue. Now, Rec frowned suddenly, exploring the boy's bare shoulder with his fingers, then turned him about. What is this? Another stripe on your young back? Nay, two of them. Who is it beats you, boy? Only last week. It's nothing. No one. Renafir shrank hastily out of his grasp. Your pardon, Nebrek. I will weigh the sweep now. Scarlet with shame, he dodged around the second craftsman's workbench and hurried to the scales. With eyes on the floor, he waited while the weigher sang out the measure to the scribe, then took his bowl and hurried out, leaving Rec still frowning after him. His shoulder had begun to throb and smart from the goldsmith's touch, like a sleeping devil roused to angry wakefulness. But the greatest pain was in his mind. It was humiliating beyond measure to have attention called to those welts. Lying there across his back, like the mark of the slave. Might the crocodiles eat that gebu? Now they had all seen, everyone in the shop and no doubt were scorning him for a poor sort of creature, cringing and puny, unable to defend himself. Then there was Ibni, heavy as a yoke. Responsibility settled over Ranafir's mind. He was convinced Ibni was the thief, though he could not say why. Ladling water into his bowl of sweepings from the big water jar, he wondered how he could prove it. The slimy creature might carry gold anywhere, in his mouth, under his sandal strap, in a loaf of bread. Imagine gold in a loaf of bread. Or in a wineskin? Renafir stood motionless, feeling all his flesh crawl. In a wineskin? Perhaps in the very ones he had been carrying home to Gebu each week. The ones whose contents were always emptied onto the pavement in the dead of night, as if the wine itself were of no value? Osiris the merciful forbid it, thought the boy. If it is so, then I too have been a thief, though I did not know it. Nay, it cannot be so. It must not be so. Yet that slim little ingot, the one he had poured but a short time ago, how easily it would slip into a wineskin. Yet he let the dipper crash back into the water jar and started for the small washing trays at the front of the courtyard, darting a glance toward the winemaker's bench as he passed. What he saw made him stop in his tracks. Only one ingot lay beside the draw plate. When the Babylonian passed this way for the drink he had not wanted, four ingots had been there. Another coil of wire lay ready for annealing. That accounted for one of them. The apprentice held another, greasing it for the draw plate. But where were the others? Where was the smallest one, which would slip so easily into a skin of wine? Ranafir's feet took him across the stretch of sun-warmed pavement to the wire, wire maker's bench without his ordering them to move. Your work goes swiftly, Hapia O, he said nervously. Swiftly? Thoth's mercy. The snail has wings compared to the hours of this day. I vow I've been pulling wire since the first hill rose out of the waters of time, and still I've not done. But, but have you not? Only a short time ago there were four fresh poured ingots on this bench. And behold, where are they now? Hapia O's hands stopped their work. Where would they be, he demanded. On this bench, and that, being drawn or hammered or... He, his eyes narrowed with anger as he seized the boy's arm. What is this you say? Do you accuse me of this thieving the master spoke of? Accuse you? Grasped, gasped Ranafir, aghast at the hornet's nest he had stirred up. As Matt is my witness, I had no thought of it. Have the kefts taken your senses, friend? Hapio? The apprentice loosed his arms, his arm, looking somewhat sheepish. I perhaps they have. I see you meant no harm, but when there's theft about, every man grows thin-skinned. By Ammon, I'll not be sorry to see this thief caught and the shop rid of him. Nor will I, Renafir said. He tried to smile carelessly, but the bowl he held was trembling. He had still not found out what he wanted to know. Theft is a wicked thing, he went on, careful to avoid the hornets. I've no doubt you have watched your ingots today as the falcon watches the lark. Happy O laughed as he threaded the tapered end of the greased golden rod through the hole in the draw plate. 
Grasping the point with his copper pincers, he began to tug it towards him, his muscles nodding. That I have, he agreed jerkily. Ab, he took two for bracelets. Zoser, the, the little one for thread. And I myself have used the others. I'll not way short at the end of the day. You may stake your life on that. I believe it, friend, murmured Ranafir. Zoser, he thought. Zoser has the little one. As he hurried on to the washing trays, he glanced towards Zoser's bench. There he was, pounding rhythmically upon two sheep hides, between which the smallest ingot would be stretching flatter and flatter into a sheet thin enough to be cut into thread and woven like linen into beautiful shining cloth. Relief swept through Ranafir like a fresh breeze off the river. Ibni had not stolen the little ingot. Perhaps he had stolen nothing at all. I am imagining the whole thing, Ranavir told himself. The wineskin has, has some other explanation. It must have. Someone else is the thief. Welcome, friend. Eyes on the ground, said a voice, half amused, half diffident. Ranavir looked up to find the new apprentice, Heket. Smiling at him uncertainly over the washing trays, he was a boy of 12 or 13, no older than Ranafir himself, though he was bigger. Both boys still wore the youth lock, a thick strand of hair left to grow from one side of their shaven heads and fall in an ebony curl to the shoulder. Both also wore amulets dangling from one wrist to protect them from kefts. Neither could boast more than a single short garment held at the waist by a rag of a sash. There the resemblance ended, however, for Heket was rich in prospects. He was safely apprenticed and destined to become a, as fine a goldsmith as teaching could make him. For a moment, pure envy filled Ranafir, as it had when Heket first appeared in the shop three days ago. Heket's smile wavered, and Ranafir controlled his feelings quickly, realizing they must show in his face. With as civil a nod as he could muster, he stepped to the new boy's side at the bench and drew a washing tray toward him. May your ka be joyful, he murmured. Does the work go well? Aye, well enough, though I do not know my head from my tail in this place, as the cat said when she tumbled into the fowler's net. After a moment's astonishment, jokes were few in his life, Renafir's rare smile spread slowly over his face. Heket brightened. By Ammon, he said, I thought you were a, sur a surly type of at first, but I see you're not. Listen then, I don't know more of what I'm doing than a hound knows of kittens, but do you understand this gold washing? Aye, of course I do. Then instruct me for the sake of Ta and Ta the bearded. That scowling one, the first craftsman, said nothing but wash these sweepings, young one, with never a word as to how or why. Are they clean yet? Aye, but there's trash still with them in the water, said Ranafir, peering into Heket's bowl. You have not poured it through a cloth? Cloth? echoed the other blankly. Ranafir pointed to the coarse linen straining cloths hanging below the bench. Come, do as I do. Together they stretched cloths over the shallow washing trays, poured in water and gold together. As the cloth sank to the bottom of the tray, the particles of gold clung to it in, the gl in a glittering residue, allowing the trash to be poured off along with the water. Now again, wash... Now again, with fresh water, directed Renifer. Ah, Heket remarked presently. I begin to find reason in this, as the priest said when he discovered the dead rat under the altar. How is it your hand is so practiced, friend? Someone has taught you well. My father taught me, said Renifer before he thought. Your father? He is a goldsmith? The gods smile on you. What else does he teach you? Renifer was biting his tongue for mentioning it. He teaches me nothing now. He answered curtly, but why? Because he went to his tomb 10 months ago to join my mother, who had, has been with the gods these many years. Heket glanced at him, then returned quickly to his work. May their baas have food and drink forever, he murmured. There was a moment's awkward silence during which Ranafir struggled without much success against the familiar, frightened loneliness that had swept in again as through an open door. Heket said presently, no one told me your name. Ranafir, the son of Thutra. Aye, I have heard of Thutra the goldsmith. 
Many heard of him. He was a friend of Zhao the master. Zhao himself praised his work. Many will hear of you too, perhaps, when you have finished your apprenticeship here and become a... I am not apprenticed here. The other turned in surprise. You are not apprenticed to wreck the goldsmith? Then what? What am I doing here? Renifer's own thought flashed back into his mind. Why does he place me here in the gold house if I am never to learn anything? Hard on that thought followed the image of the wineskin, like a dismaying answer. Dismaying answer. He turned to Hecat more brusquely than he intended. I am a porter. I pour ingots and wash sweepings and run errands. Ibni's errands, he thought with sinking heart, for five debon a month. It is work you will not long be troubled with. After your first month, the hirelings will do it for you. I will do it for you. It is all I am allowed to do. Yet I understand annealing and wire making as well as the first craftsman. I have even graven armbands and hammered out cups. He sloshed gold and water into his tray. Perhaps not very good cups, he added more humbly, but they were cups. And gone now, he added to himself, gone like everything else, like my father's house and the garden with the acacia trees and old Maria who used to make me date cakes and the workshop with the shelves all around the walls and the golden collars and daggers hanging from them, gone like my father. The workshop came clear into his mind until it seemed as if he were there again, this minute smelling the acacia blossoms just outside the door. Hour upon hour in the old days, he had leaned upon his father's workbench, watching the long, strong hands of the artist shape a bowl or a massive ornament, fashion chains and necklaces of such delicate grace that the eye delighted in them. He could remember that very feel of the smooth-worn wood under his elbows, the heat of the lamp on his cheek, as he learned with his eyes, with his memory, asking countless questions. Even through the last two years, the ailing years of Thutra's life, the artist had lain on a couch in the workroom, watching his son's first efforts at raising and engraving, teaching him to improve his designs. Besides the gold work, there was Yeti, the old greyhound to romp with, the tales his father read him from the leather scrolls, and every morning, lessons at the scribe's school, so that Ranafir too had begun to read a little. Now there was nothing, less than nothing. Now there was hunger and beatings and this new hideous suspicion about the wineskins. Heket cleared his throat uncertainly. It is an evil thing that you cannot go on learning, he said. Where do you live then, if not in the apprentice's quarters or with your parents? It was a moment before Renifer answered. He kept his eyes on his hands, which were raking the gold scraps aimlessly about on the cloth. At last, he said, I live with my half-brother, Gebu, the stone cutter. Ah, you did not say you had a brother. Half-brother, Renifer repeated. He grudged admitting even that relationship. Until the confused and grief-stricken morning of his father's death ten months ago, he had been only vaguely aware that there was another son of Thutra, somewhere in Thebes, a firstborn child of an early marriage whose name was never mentioned in Thutra's presence. Twisting the wet cloth around the mass of sweepings, Renifer cast about for some way to change the subject. He did not want to talk of these things or even think of them. He must speak of something else, quickly, before this boy could ask more questions. Hecat was already talking. Half-brother, then. But I do not understand this half-brother of yours, my friend. Why does he not apprentice you to wreck, that you may learn to make beautiful things like your father? Because, because I must earn the debon, five a month, when he could be learning the skill that would bring him dozens. The answer sounded foolish even to himself, and in the light of what he now suspected it was, was absurd. Nervously avoiding Hecat's puzzled gaze, he added, Gebu cares nothing for gold working. He sees no value in apprenticing me to a wreck. Then it is strange he does not apprentice you to himself. At the stone cutting shop, it seems to me he would think your labor there of far more value than I know that. I know not what he thinks. He prefers me to work here. Then why, since you are here, will he not let me be? Renifer gasped, whirling on him. Can you not let me be? I am tired of your questions. 
Abruptly, he left the workbench, twisting and wringing the bag of gold straps. Scarcely knowing where he stepped, he blundered his way to the far end of the courtyard and spread his sweepings on a sun-warmed sheep hide to dry. Already he was miserably regretting his rudeness to the young apprentice, who he knew had meant him no harm. Now Hakep would again decide that he was a surly type and would no longer care to be friends. Too often it happened so. If only there, they would not ask me questions, thought Renifir. Why must they make me talk of the, these things that I wish to forget? Meanwhile, there was this gold to be dried and melted, and in haste, too, for the great god Ra was sinking lower and lower in the sky. Soon the god's shining boat would touch the tops of the western cliffs, and the working day would be done. Before that, an ingot must be poured from these sweepings, as the first, first craftsman had ordered. Renifir spread a fresh cloth over the glittering debris on the sheepskin, pressing it down with his palms to hasten the drying process. He found himself thinking how easy it would be to drop a few of these scraps into a wineskin when no one was watching. True, the Babylonian seldom handled the sweep, nor had he stolen the little ingot as Renifir had at first suspected, but he did have access to the storeroom. He did work all day washing the raw gold, fresh from the mines, in the big vats at the rear of the shop. That was the answer. That was where Ibni got the gold, from the leather sacks, heavy with trash and gravel, brought in each week from the mines in the southern d desert. What could be easier than to drop a pinch of gold dust, a few nuggets, into a wine skin instead of into the washing vats? The difference in weight would be written off as trash, which defied precise weighing, or laid to or laid to a fault in the scales. In fact, it had taken Wreck and his wear all these months to decide that it was not the scales. Sick at heart, Renifir transferred his sweepings to a crucible and set it on the coals. He must tell Wreck at once, of course, but watching the flames grow scarlet around the crucible, Renifir thought about that but to inform on Ibni would be nothing. Renifir would be heartily glad to see the last of him and for the shop it would be good riddance but to do that he must inform on himself as well he must confess that it was he who had carried the gold away time after time every 10 or 15 days of all the months he had worked at the shop and Ranafir went cold with panic it would mean informing on gebu as well Great Amon, he would kill me, thought the boy. He would kill me and throw me to the crocodiles or sell me for a slave as he is always threatening. Or, in the crucible, the gold collapsed suddenly into molten scarlet. Renifir snatched the stones that protected his hands and began pouring the metal into the mold he had oiled to receive it. It was difficult. His hands were shaking so that he could scarcely control the flow. I'm not really sure of all of this, he thought. I have no proof. That's it. One must have proof. Perhaps it is all my own imagining. I will not tell Wreck yet. When the day was done, he hurried from the shop, unable to meet the goldsmith's kindly eye. Chapter 2 The light was beginning to fade as Ranafir left Wreck's courtyard and hurried down the street of the goldsmith's toward the Nile. Behind him, the sky flamed over the mummy-shaped outline of the Libyan cliffs, gateway to the awesome Valley of the Tombs of the Kings. Directly ahead of him, across the river, was with its vivid square sails, rose the highest bank and the other half of the ancient city of Thebes. Massive gateways, temples, roofs, and whitewashed walls, rising thick along in its crowded streets, traced a long, angular pattern against the sky. To Ranafir, it was a different world, that city across the river. Here on the western bank was the Thebes he knew, a vast jumble of workshops and laboratories known as the City of the Dead. Its low mud brick buildings formed a broad belt between the green fields at the riverside and the strip of desert at the foot of the western cliffs, spreading north almost to the cliff's curve, giving way in the south to high-walled gardens and the villas of rich noblemen, which clustered around the dazzling white pile of Pharaoh's palace. Turning from the street of the goldsmiths, Renifir 
entered a sun-baked thoroughfare thronged with workers from every part of the city of the dead, artisans, laborers, apprentices, whose guttural speech and varied odors filled the air around him. They were clean-shaven, with skin the color of tarnished copper. Their eyelids were rimmed and elongated almost to their temples with black eye paint, best protection against Egypt's glaring sun. Their shoulders were broad and bare, their hips narrow and wrapped in cotton shanties of purest white. Their hands, those strong and supple hands, now gesturing or fingering their amulets or swinging idly at their sides, were the cleverest in the world, for these were the glass makers and paper makers, the weavers, carpenters, and potters, the sculptors, painters, embalmers, masons, and coffin builders of hundred gated Thebes. And Thebes, as all men knew, was the center of the universe. Because of these artisans, full of laughter and vigorous life though they were, the western half of Thebes was called the city of the dead. The most of for most of the objects they fashioned with such skill vanished into Egypt's tombs to become the possessions of the dead. Even the lowliest fisherman went to his eternal rest, accompanied by a little food and furniture, a length of new linen, a string of beads, his weapons or tools, whatever comforts the living could provide for the ba of a loved one beginning his 3,000 years in the land of the West. As for the wealthy, their tombs were underground mansions crammed with gold and treasure. Death provided a constant market for the wares of the city of the dead, and the living bought much for themselves as well. Therefore the shops hummed with industry day after day, and the craftsmen were many. Now this day was done, and the artisans were homeward bound. A few turned in the direction of the Nile, where high proud powered excuse me, where high proud ferry boats waited to take them across to eastern Thebes, but the majority scattered to homes near their shops in the city of the dead. Ranafir was among the latter, but he lacked their eagerness. On the contrary, the nearer he drew to his own street, the more slowly he walked. At the best of times, he would rather go anywhere than home. This evening, he dreaded it with all his soul. Gebu had two aspects, one noisily jocular, one ferociously quiet. There was no knowing which to expect on any given day. And indeed, there was little to choose between them. As Ranafir had long ago learned, it was a matter of whether one preferred to be kicked aside like a bit of debris or subjected to a concentrated and abusive notice. Whichever it was to be tonight, Ranafir did not see how he could face Gebu and conceal the thing he knew, and he did not know what he was going to do about it. As the last corner appeared ahead, he re his reluctant feet slowed still more and finally stopped altogether. He stood a moment, took an irresolute step backward, then swerved suddenly and ran down a lane between two of the flower fields near the river. He must think this out. He would go home presently. Later he would go, because he must, but first he must think. Once past the flower fields, the lane narrowed to a path that meandered through the thickets edging the river. The ground turned marshy here, Patches of sedge and papyrus marked pools of shallow water, and the further Ranafir went, the more the bushes of the thicket gave way to clumps of slender, rustling reeds higher than his head. He was soon wading oftener than he was walking, but the thick, soft mud felt good to his feet, and he wandered aimlessly on, trying to make himself believe that his suspicions were unfounded. Perhaps one of the apprentices had been hiding gold dust in his sandal. Perhaps the other porter. It was no use. The missing gold, the wine Gebu wanted but never drank, the grinning Babylonian with a sharp glance and his soft, insistent questions, all fitted into a picture too clear to doubt. What was he to do about it? To tell Rek would mean accusing Gebu, and to accuse Gebu. Oh, Ranafir stood nibbling his thumbnail. The very idea of accusing Gebu made him shiver. Yet the thieving must be stopped, and there was only himself to stop it. Perhaps, if he only threatened to tell whatever he knew. He had reached the true marsh now, where thicket gave way entirely to the dense fringe of papyrus growing in the shallow margins of the Nile. As he turned back toward drier land, the reeds behind him rattled, and he whirled. Good evening to you, young one, said a surprised voice. An old man had appeared through the papyrus stalks, 
wading up to his calves in the brown water. He was stooped and leather-skinned with one blind eye and hair like coarse white linen thread. There were smears of river mud on his bare knees and his shenty, and on the gnarled hand with which he held the reeds aside as he gazed with mild astonishment at the boy. Behind him was a small elderly donkey, loaded high with papyrus stalks. Renifer had seen the pair often hobbling about the streets of the City of the Dead, but their sudden appearance here sent his wits scattering like startled birds. G Good evening to you, ancient, he stammered at last. So you've tongue after all, remarked the old one. I wondered if exalted Lord Crocodile had stolen it. Exalted? Do you speak of the crocodile god, Lord Sock, or only of the muddy beast in the... St softly, boy. The old man darted a glance, half humorous, half anxious toward the Nile. Perhaps his lordship is muddy. Yes, but what is a little mud? Speak politely of the noble beast, as one learns to, who must work each day within reach of his jaws. Renifer smiled uncertainly as the old man's face seemed into a thousand wrinkles of pleasure. There now, he can smile too, eh? My lotus, my little donkey, perhaps he is not so burdened with trouble as we thought when we first saw his face. Is this not a strange hour to come fishing, young one? Ross sailed through the gates of the west half an hour ago. I did not come here to fish, muttered the boy, immediately nervous again. Did his thoughts show so plainly? If so, there was small chance of hiding them from Gebu. He must come out with it somehow. He snatched one of the stiff blooms from a nearby clump of sedge and showed it to the old man in explanation. I came only to seek a flower for my, my friend. I must go now, ancient. May your ka be joyful. Abruptly, he turned and ran back the way he had came, leaving the old man to make what he might of it. I will threaten to tell what I know, he resolved as he hurried between the darkening fields. I will make Gebu promise to stop. It's the only way. The dusk had filled the streets now, and this time Renifer did not pause when he came in sight of the last corner, but set his mouth tight and hastened into the street of the crooked dog. It was a narrow and dirty lane. Its houses joined one to another to form a continuous wall on either hand. Like the sides of a canyon, Renifer pushed open the third door on the left and slipped into the courtyard, his bare feet silent on the rough pavement. Closing the gate behind him, he stopped and looked about warily. The dim light was kind to the skimping walled court, glossing over some of the rubbish that littered it, concealing the smaller cracks and peeling whitewash of the narrow mud brick house and occupied, that occupied the west half of the enclosure. The storerooms forming the ground floor of the house were dark and empty, with their doors ajar. From the rear of the court, a stair sloped above them, to a single high room overlooking the street. From the open strip under the roof of this room, yellow torchlight glowed, and Ranafir's eyes fixed on it. Gebu was at home. Moistening his lips, the boy drew a long breath and padded across the courtyard toward the storerooms. Perhaps he could find something to eat before the storeroom door squeaked, betraying his presence. Who's there? growled the stonecutter's voice from the upper room. Is it you, useless one? Get you here to the stairway. Silently, Renifer turned from the storeroom door and walked to the foot of the stair. His half-brother stood at the top, a torch in his hand. Obviously, there was to be no jocularity tonight. I must tell him now, Renifer thought. I must threaten him. You are late in coming, the harsh voice grated. Very late. Where have you been? At, at the shop. Until this hour, I was delayed. There was a last ingot. Renifer's voice trailed away as Gebu started down the, the stairs, thrusting his torch into a bracket on his way. There was no expression on Gebu's face. He was like a figure hewn out of one of his own blocks of stone. His legs were massive columns, his face a crag, with a granite hard jaw and eyes black as chunks of obsidian beneath their painted lids. One of the eyes winked spasmodically at intervals, lending an eerie liveliness to an otherwise motionless countenance. He reached the foot of the stairs and stood there winking. His bulk 
his bulk dwarfing the boy, who was thin as a reed. Again, Ranafir moistened his lips. I must tell him, he thought. Instead, he said, It is true I walked down to the river on my way home in order to cool my feet in the mud. You can see I plucked a white bloom while I was there. With fumbling hands, he in intricated, extricated the wilting blossom from the folds of his sash. The stonecutter looked at it, then at Ranafir. Suddenly, a fist like a boulder crashed against the side of the boy's head, sending him sprawling. Scum! You have been some other place. Where did you go? Who did you talk to? No one, I swear it, Renifer cried. Only an old papyrus cutter I chanced upon in the reeds with his donkey. You lie. Nay, I speak the truth as Matt is my witness. Renifer dodged a kick and scrambled to his feet, shrinking back against the wall. If he had needed further evidence for his suspicions, here it was, in the accursed one's distrust. Rubbing his cheek, he blurted angrily, You need not fear. I have told no one about the wineskins and what is in them yet. Instantly, he was aghast at his own temerity. Gebu had gone men menacingly still. Indeed, he said softly. And what is it in the wines? What is in the wineskins save wine? You know that already, and Ibni knows. But I did not know until today. Gebu moved closer, thrusting his face into the boys. What do you know? Ranafir small swallowed, pressing back against the wall in a vain effort to retreat. He knew nothing at all, nothing he could prove. I know gold has been missing from the shop, he insisted. I know they are weighing even the sweep. Indeed, said Gebu again, but in a different tone. He straightened slowly and his great shoulders relaxed. His speculative eyes went over the boy. So deliberately and in such pitiless detail that Ranafir became vividly aware of every de defect in his unprepossessing small person, the ribs that showed, the undernourished arms and knobby knees, the dusty rag of a shenty that always hung askew on his hips. By the time Gebu turned his eyes away, Ranafir felt more insignificant than the lowliest beetle in the roadway. And what has all that to do with me? Gebu said. I, it, it, I tell you the goldsmith is suspicious. I dare not carry the wineskins home anymore, or they will. Worthless one. The heavy hand slapped back and forth across Ranafir's face, almost negligently, yet with a force that twisted a crick into his neck and set his ears ringing. I know nothing of this gold. And if you do, you had best pretend otherwise. As for the wineskins, they contain date wine, and you will bring them to me as before. Nay, I will not do it, Renifer cried miserably. He knew he had failed. Everything had gone wrong somehow. Gebu was no longer worried. He was only contemptuous. I will not bring them, he repeated. I, you'll bring them. Gebu half smiled and his eyelid jerked. Are you so stupid that you do not understand? I know nothing of your stolen gold. No man can prove otherwise. If you would put your own head in a noose, you have only to go babbling to wreck. My head? Ranafir stared at him, bewildered. Then he felt his scalp prickle as he realized that what Gebu meant, why he had suddenly ceased to worry, and why it was utterly useless to say a word to wreck. Gebu would merely deny that he had ever seen the gold. He would deny any knowledge of the Babylonian, of the wineskins, of any part of it, he would shrug and shake his head over the wickedness of boys and point to Ranafir as the thief. Gabu could be very convincing when he chose. And who would defend Ranafir? Not Ibni, certainly. He would only add his accusations to Gebu's. Not Rek, who would be scornful and hurt. There would be no one except himself to speak the truth. And who would believe his tale? Bitterly conscious of defeat, Ranafir turned away and started for the storeroom. Instantly, Gebu jerked him back. Where are you going, pig's son? Did I say I was finished? I, I want my bread. I'm hungry. Your bread? When did it come to be yours? By Ammon, you have grown too top lofty of late, behaving like Pharaoh instead of the gutter waif you are. I, a waif, and remember it. Where would you be this moment had I not offered you food and lodging out of the goodness of my heart, sleeping in the dust of the streets? 
I and fighting the dogs for their leavings. Instead, you live comfortably on my bread. It is mine too. I earn five debon a month and give you all of it. Gebu's heavy lip curled. Five debon, a fortune. It is all they will pay for Porter's work. Renifer was struggling against tears. Without hope, he offered the old plea. I could earn more, much more, if I could learn, become a pupil, a craftsman. Listen to the princeling. What do pupils earn? Nothing. They must pay instead, of, instead for their own instruction. Who would pay for yours, fatherless one, homeless one? The last words cut like strokes of a lash. Renifer bent his head under them. An apprentice then, if you would apprentice me to wreck, take care I do not apprentice you to some fishmonger, ingrate. I could have you bound over to, to myself at the stone-cutting shop, but did I? Nay, I found your work to your liking. Come, is it not so? Was it not I, Gebu, who placed you in wreck the goldsmith's shop? Only to help you steal, Renifer whispered. Watch your tongue. Gebu raised one fist with the other. He shoved Renifer against the wall and pinned him there. The boy sucked in his breath, squinting in expectation of the blow, his back pressed against the rough bricks until their edges dug into his flesh. The fist knotted together tighter, tighter. Renifer, with every nerve and muscle taut, felt a wave of fear that was almost nausea. With a scornful laugh, Gebu lowered his fist to his side, leaving the boy limp and covered with cold sweat. Look at you, the stone cutter jeered, cowering there like a cringing puppy. Can you not stand on your feet when I talk to you? Renifer straightened, sick with humiliation. A cursed one, he thought. I hate him, I hate him. He makes of me not only a thief, but a coward. It is only that I am hungry, he mumbled. Hungry always, you are hungry. Why did you not dig yourself a few lotus roots while you dawdled by the river? Many such brats as you get nothing else and think themselves well off. The lecture might have gone on for some time, but Gebu had evidently grown bored with baiting him. Still muttering irritably, he plucked the torch from its bracket and strode down the court. Renifer followed in silence. The invariable reaction to a scene with Gebu had begun to set in, a fatigue so deep it penetrated mind and body alike. Gebu went into the second storeroom, emerging, emerging presently with one of the small flat loaves of Egyptian bread, but when Renifer reached for it, he drew it back. Did the Babylonian say anything today for you to tell me? Wearily, Renifer prodded his memory. I, he said he would send wine tomorrow. Good. Gebu's eyelid fluttered as he stared fixedly at the boy. You will bring it. Do you understand? He broke the bread, giving half to the boy and thrusting the rest into his own mouth. I'm expecting friends. He mumbled through it. Open the gate when they come. Winking vindictively, he made for the stairs and vanished up them, taking the torch with him. Renifer stood alone in the dark courtyard, holding his piece of bread, half a loaf, it barely covered his palm, and the emptiness in his stomach felt as big as the whole temple of Ammon. The emptiness in his heart matched it. Gebu's last warning had needed no underscoring. On dragging feet, he padded into the storeroom, felt his way to the big water jug and drank thirstily. Afterward, he searched through, though without hope, for another bite of something. A forgotten onion, a mouthful of stewed lentils left from Gebu's meal, the store room yielded nothing more except the tantalizing fragrance from boxes and kegs all sealed and forbidden him. He left it and crossed the courtyard to the far farthest corner where his sleeping mat was spread under a straggling acacia tree. Flinging himself upon the rough fibers, he held the bread to his nose and its yeasty fragrance brought the saliva rushing into his mouth. He began to eat slowly, carefully, making each mouthful last as long as he could. All too soon it was gone, leaving him only the craving for more. He lay back, pillowing his head on his hands. He could have given me the whole loaf, he thought. They are small enough at best. I could eat twenty of them. Thirty. The pig was punishing me for trying to defy him. I. If only I were free of him. If only I could climb aboard a boat and sail far, far away and never see this courtyard or the street of the crooked dog again. In all my life, what if I tried it? 
What if I ran away tomorrow? The thought filled him with the old panic. Ah, but what would I do then, he thought. How would I live? It was impossible. He would not think of it. He would think of a day to come when he was a man and would have gold of his own and could buy all the bread he wanted. But how would he get this gold if he grew up ignorant, fit only to be a porter? No matter, he would get it somehow. Perhaps he would find it. People did find gold sometimes, hidden away in the crevices of the hills or under an old house, buried there by some someone long dead and forgotten. Aye, that was it. He would find it. Renifer closed his eyes, smiling to himself. He could almost see the little gold ingots, row on row, lining the walls of some secret cave that only he, he would know about. He would take one home each week to Gebu, and there would be no more beatings. Nay, there would be no more Gebu. He would have a house of his own. He, Renifer, the son of Thutra, he would buy fresh salted fish and milk and lentils and a honey cake, many honey cakes. The gods would smile on him and Osiris himself. Osiris the merciful would speak out of the wind to him and direct all his affairs. Aye, and better than all, he would use the ingots for gold working. He would make a broad, fine bowl with a pattern of reed flowers inlaid in silver wire, and he would make a little eye paint pot with a hinged lid and a bracelet, perhaps two bracelets. How would he fashion them? In the form of snakes, perhaps, with garnet eyes? Or should he shape them like lilies with long stems twining about the arm? Ay, like lilies, and they would be more beautiful than the moon, and all Thebes would stand in wonder before them. Thou the master would see them and would carry them to Pharaoh, who would buy them immediately for many coppers, and the fame of Ranafir the goldsmith would spread through all the black land. He would take a few pup pupils, only the talented ones, as Zhao did, and become. A knocking sounded at the gate. Ranafir jerked up his head and stared about dazedly. The stars had come out over the silent courtyard, revealing the rubbish-strewn pavement and peeling walls in all their ugly reality. He sighed, dragged himself to his feet, and walked across the court. The moment he unlatched the gate, it was shoved open with a violence that all but knocked him down. Massaging his bruised ribs, he squinted resentfully into the glare of a torch. Where is the stone cutter? grunted a thick voice. It was Setma, the Nile boat captain. One needed only one's nose to recognize his characteristic aura of river, river stink and barley beer fumes. Renifer jerked his head in the direction of the stairway, up there. The man brushed past, almost dropping his torch in his unsteady progress to, along the courtyard. In his wake came another man, a tall, stooped figure, with a dark cloak folded about him like drooping wings. He was not drunk like the river man, but Renifer drew back from him instinctively. When I'm on, he was called. He was a mason. He paused, gazed at the boy a moment with glittering bright eyes, then followed the riverman to the stair on the feet that made no more sound than at a keft's. Shivering, Renifer latched the gate and went back to his mat. Gabu was bad enough, but his friends were worse. Renifer had long been sure that Wenaman possessed the evil eye. He fingered his amulet nervously, hoping it had, pro had protected him, but he knew it had no power over the evil eye. That required a different amulet, the Auzate, shaped like the sacred eye of the god Horus. His was only the life sign, Ankh, a green glazed cross with a looped top tied to his wrist with seven knots to bind his spirit to his body. He could remember the old magician his father had, had bought it from and how safe he had felt when it it was made fast over the exposed pulse through which his ka might try to escape. Safe. Aye, it had kept his ka in his body, but it had saved him from little else. Not from Gebu, not from beatings and hunger, not from Ibni and his hateful wit wineskins. Renifer rolled onto his back, trying to switch his thoughts again to the secret cave full of ingots. But... The little golden bars kept turning into wineskins in his mind or into loaves of bread that vanished when he tried to touch them. His stomach nodded with hunger and his mind with worry. 
He could not bring that accursed wineskin on the morrow, knowing what it contained. Yet what would Gebu do if he appeared without it? Fear dried his mouth at the very thought. He was afraid of Gebu and his heavy fist, afraid of his own hunger. Most of all, afraid of the void that yawned always on his right hand, waiting for Gebu to, to turn him out, sleeping in the dust of the streets, fighting the dogs for their leavings. I am a coward, he thought, a cringing puppy, as Gebu said, and tomorrow I shall become a thief because I am afraid. Saying it, even to himself without a sound, somehow cleared his mind. He, Ranafir the son of Thutra, a thief? Staring up through the ragged branches of the acacia, to the st stars spangling the dark sky, he could see only the kindly face of Rek, the goldsmith, rising before him in reproach. He turned over and flung an arm over his eyes. I'll not do it, he told himself fiercely. Never, never, not a grain of gold, not a scrap will I bring that evil one. Let him beat me all he likes. Let him have his bread. I'll find my own somehow or do without, but I'll be no thief. The reproachful face faded from his mind and his tension vanished, driven out by the exalted sense of heroism with which his own words had filled him. He began to picture himself, a larger, more muscular self, nearly Gebu's size, standing with proudly up upflung head before the stone cutter, defying him, smiling coolly at his raging, easily sidestepping his poorly aimed blows and walking at last from the hateful courtyard without deigning to glance back. Then he would go to the gold house of Zhao, the master, and beg to be accepted as a pupil. Had not Zhao almost said he would accept him? A month before he fa his father died, when Zhao had come to inquire after his old friend's health, he had looked at the little cups and armbands Renifer had hammered out, and he had said to Thatra, your son shows skill, perhaps when he is older. Then the evil day of death had come, and old Marie, Maria had told Ranafir, weeping, that there would be scarcely enough coppers left for bread after his father's tomb was furnished, and the embalmers paid, and the offerings made to the priests of the necro necropolis. He could not even go back to the scribe's school, where he had been learning to read, much less think of Zhao, who charged a pupil's fee. Even though Zhao was there among the mourners at his father's house that morning, Renifir had not dared to speak to him, but had stood watching him from a corner, thinking, later, maybe later when I am older. All the world was grief and confusion that day. Then Gebu had come, a solid form blocking out the sunlight in the doorway so that everyone turned to look at him. In the silence, he had stepped into the room as if he owned... It, as indeed it seemed he did. He had a scribe's paper that proved his claims as a firstborn. Before this stranger with his scrap of paper, Zhao and Thutra's older, other old friends had stepped aside, departing one by one to their houses and out of Ranafir's life. Soon old Maria, Maria vanished too. Gebu sold her at the common slave market to pay for funerary arrangements. He sold the last of Thutra's gold work and his tools and his work table. Then he took everything left in the house, including Ranafir, and moved them to the street of the Crooked Dog. And that was the settlement of Thutra's estate. Ranafir found himself sitting up on his mat in the courtyard, staring blindly into the dark. Frowning, he threw himself down again, pulling an edge of the matting over his bare legs. No need to think about all that again, he told himself. All will be different now. I shall defy Gebu. I shall leave the street of the crooked dog forever. Ah, then anything will be possible. The golden ingots, those ingots in that hidden cave I shall discover. I can use those to pay my pupil's fee. Then Pharaoh will buy my necklaces for Queen Tai, who is beautiful and kind, and she will smile on me. Ranafir, the son of Thutra, and I will not be a thief." Curled into as tight a ball as possible against the chill of the night, Ranafir slept at last.